Good morning. Welcome to another Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I'm the curator here at Ashland, and it's great to be with you this morning. I want to thank the pre-mutual funds for their support of our series. Um, we're very grateful that they've made it possible for us uh, to do the series we've been doing, and we've enjoyed it a great deal, and we hope you have and are glad to be able to continue it. Uh, so today, we're going to do the second part. Ah, good morning. That's my wife, Twyla. And that means my cat, LV, is also watching. Hello, LV. Uh, we're going to finish our two-part series on images of the Clay family. Last week, as you'll recall, we looked at portrait miniatures. And today, we're going to consider photography, um, which was very, very important, developed in the time of Henry Clay, and he became one of the first people widely photographed. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about one other thing uh, of some import. I know there are some of you out there watching who annually track this information. Good morning, Sue, our uh, board member and uh, devoted volunteer. Good to see you. Uh, and that is our Derby Report. Every year I run the list of horses for the Oaks and the Derby to check to see who is in those races that descends in the female tail lines of Henry Clay's prize mares. And this year I ran those lists. There are no entrants in the Oaks this year, but there is a Derby entry. And I'm not sure I can pronounce this name entirely properly, but I'll do my best. Sol or Sole Volante is descended from Magnolia through Skedaddle. We actually have a painting of Skedaddle in the collection, and we put, posted an image of that on our Facebook page so you can see it there. Uh, this horse is not exactly a favorite. It went out at 30 to 1 odds. It is running from the 12 spot, which is generally a pretty good place to be in the middle. Um, not a horse that has a lot of experience or has proven himself a great deal on dirt. A horse whose, whose pedigree seems to lean towards turf, but hey, who knows? Um, it's a strange year and a strange derby, and anything can happen, so we'll hope for the best um, to try to end our streak. It's been going since 1983, so we have not had a winner in a while. So, we'll let you know what happens. We hope you'll watch that and enjoy that. But let's turn our attention now to photography. I'm going to look at a number of photographs from the collection, um, some that are on loan to us, a few that are on loan to us. Um, but I want to show you a variety of different photographic uh, processes and formats uh, that have been used over the years to record the family, uh, talk about how that worked, and the relationship of this family to photography. A lot of information we have in our tours comes from photographs, and so it's a very important medium for us. Um, we, we learn a lot from looking at the pictures that we have. Uh, the first commercially successful photographic process was the daguerreotype process, invented by a Frenchman named Daguerre in the 1830s, and it was in the United States by 1840, and one of the first people widely photographed with that was Henry Clay. Good morning, Mike, another of our volunteers. Uh, and it took off pretty quickly, became very popular very rapidly, uh, so that was the first process used uh, to capture images. I'm going to show you one we have here. This one we don't own. It is on loan to us. That's Andrew Eugene Irwin, a grandson of Henry Clay's. Uh, you can tell a daguerreotype, you know, we're looking at them, they have kind of a mirror finish, and the way you tilt the image makes a difference in whether it's visible or not. It's a little hard to see that on the screen, but that's how you can tell it's a, daguer a daguerreotype. If it's on glass, and it has a kind of a mirror reflection quality, that's a daguerreotype. Those typically date from, say, 1840 to the mid-1850s, late 1850s. I think there were some people still doing them in the Civil War, um, but that's a particular pro That's the first successful process. Um, around that same time, not long after, another process came along called the ambrotype. And the advantage of the ambrotype is that it does not have that reflective quality, which means you can very easily see the image. That is also Eugene Irwin, this time in his Confederate Civil War uniform. Uh, the Civil War was the first war, not the first war recorded, but the first war in which photography was used to make statements about war, in which people could gain an understanding of the nature of war through photography. People like Matthew Brady would go to Civil War battlefields and capture the carnage of the war, and it changed the way people viewed war ever after. The first war that was actually captured photographically was the Mexican War, 
Mexican-American War. And there actually exists a daguerreotype from that war of Henry Clay's son, Henry Jr. There are also daguerreotypes of his burial place in Mexico from a set of photographs at the Eamon Carter Museum, which are the very first war photographs ever taken. Most of those, I don't, I don't think any of those, actually show aftermath of battles or that sort of thing. That was something that didn't come until the Civil War. These two images are what are called tin types. This became very popular during the war. These are relatively durable, lightweight, easy to carry. Uh, so they became another popular format, and they are done on metal. So I think is actually steel, not tin, but they're referred to as tin types. Now, in this case, we have two images, and I have no idea who these people are. Um, Maybe some of the McDowells. No, I'm not sure. That happens. We have any number of photos in our collection that we have not yet identified the subjects. As I'm sure many of you do, if you have a large collection of family photographs, it's not unusual to have some that you just don't know who the people are. It wasn't written down, and you know if they're pictures from a long time ago, that information may simply be lost. Uh, sometimes you see these come up at yard sales or at auctions. We refer to those as instant ancestors, just add story. So... Anyway, hopefully someday we'll figure these out and know more about what's going on. Another form that came along around the time of the Civil War is the carte de visite. These are small, rectangular photographs. Some would liken them perhaps to tobacco cards that were inserted with tobacco products in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, these are printed on cardstock. You can see here, this is Henry Clay and his wife. This is actually an image that came from a daguerreotype uh, that was taken, we think, around the time of their 50th anniversary. And you can see some of the age and uh, the whole life has taken on them, I suppose. But these were printed not only for individuals, I mean, personal family and whatever, but for sale. Good morning, Julie. Julie is our uh, most local descendant, I guess, one of our most local descendants and regular viewer. Nice to see you. Um, so these things uh, were often sold. Uh, photographers would take images like Henry Clay, someone well-known, someone famous, and sell them. If you look on the back, you can see that this one is from a uh, photographer named E. Anthony in New York City. And he actually took pictures of Henry Clay himself. So um, that's a pretty interesting picture. We have several of these in the collection, including this one. Uh, these were often kept in albums, and I'm going to show you an album here in a minute. Um... Uh, the cabinet card is not dissimilar, but they're a little larger. These are, I don't know, three by three by six, something like that, three by five. These were meant to be displayed in glass front cabinets, stood up. They're thick cardboard. So uh, this is Henry Clay's son, uh, James. Uh, this is actually a painting. We actually own this painting. It's hanging down in the uh, ash bedroom. So uh, that's a photograph of a painting, and this is James's son Charles. He was in the Spanish-American War. You can see him there in his uniform. We actually own that uniform jacket as well. I want to come back to this one a minute um, because there's an important name on it. You see here Mullen, Lexington, Kentucky. Mullen was the preeminent photographer in Lexington from about 1865 until about 1910, so for decades he was the guy, and many took many pictures of the Clays and uh, Clay-related subjects, uh, very well known. We see his name on a lot of pictures. So uh, he is a very, very important source of information about Lexington and its history in the immediate post-bellum, antebellum, uh, post-bellum, post-Civil War period. So someone that is a very important part of our story. This is an album. This is actually a family album. Um, this comes from the Thomas Hart Clay family, Henry Clay's son Thomas. This is on loan to us, but it's a neat example. And you can see here's a, a cabinet card. Uh, this gentleman is, I uh, believe, Thomas Hart Clay Jr., who was in the state militia before the war. And this is his brother. Uh, there's another Mullen cabinet card. You see there. But there are lots of family images in this album. And you can see that you could put cabinet cards in it. Let's see here. i make this easy to see. Uh, that's actually a, a home, I think, that is a home where uh, Henry Clay's grandson lived in Tennessee. Great-grandson. Grandson. The family tree gets confusing. 
These are uh, cabinet car, uh, carts to visit. You can see here, so they, these pages are designed to hold them. I want to show you one image in particular because it's kind of neat and kind of important. There's Henry Clay's son, John. Like many families, probably like some of your families, images were traded. So Julia asks about how images were developed, and the, the quality is good. Uh, these exposures typically took some time. So daguerreotypes, for example, take about 20 seconds of exposure. You have to sit there for 20 seconds while the image is, is uh, taking, whereas today, you, know, you click the button, click, it's done. Uh, and daguerreotypes develop in the camera. They're what's called a wet plate process. Ambrotypes are the same way. Uh, the, the plate is then removed from the camera, and there's a process afterward. So those are developed on site. Uh, later processes probably did involve a dark room um, at a photographic studio. I don't know a lot about the processes themselves. Good morning, Stephanie. Stephanie Pools, former Ashland business manager. Uh, and ah, there's the one I wanted. That is the only existing image of Henry Clay's son, Thomas. There are other copies, but that's the only original, a tiny little carte de visite. So it's kind of a neat album that we have here. Um, a lot of neat pictures. It's always fun to look at look at those photos. Uh, these are stereo cards. Stereo views became popular, oh, probably by the 1870s or 80s. Uh, and stereo views are three-dimensional. So you put them in a viewer, you look through a pair of eyepieces, there are uh, mirrors, and essentially you have two images that are almost identical, and they operate on the principle that we have stereoscopic vision, meaning each eye looks and sees an image, and the brain merges those images into one three-dimensional image. This is essentially using lenses to fool your mind into doing that. So it's, it, when you look at this through a, a viewer, it looks three-dimensional. Um, if any of you have ever used a ViewMaster, a ViewMaster is just a stereoscope uh, rendered small and lightweight and using a, uh, a round disc with little tiny sort of uh, positive images on film, but it's the same principle. This one is really fun, I like this. This is Nanette McDowell Bullock, and that may be her sister. Uh, she is standing at the Newell Post at the bottom of the stairs here at Ashland. That's actually uh, the back stair. No, that's the front staircase. Uh, anyway, she's standing there, uh, and she's wearing a bodice. We actually own that bodice. It's in the collection. We frequently display this image with the bodice. We aren't sure what they were doing, some sort of costume kind of thing, uh, but it's a neat image nonetheless to see a sort of a personal thing, a thing of that's intimate, that's, you know, not posed or whatever. This one is of Ashland. This was taken out front. I don't know who took this. Uh, and it's kind of, I would guess you would be standing sort of towards the corner of McDowell and Richmond Road, maybe a little down McDowell. And you can see the fence that was ran, ran across in front of the mansion. Uh, this is probably, I don't know. 1890 or something. I think it says on here. Um, that one it does not have any indication of who made it, so it's hard to say. Uh, we also have pictures of horses. I'll show you a horse since we're getting close to Derby. That's Dictator. Dictator is a standard bred. He belonged to Major Henry Clay McDowell. Uh, very successful on the track. So we have horses, pictures of all sorts of things, including the horses. By the end of the 19th century, Photography became personal. You could buy your own camera. They were relatively easy to use and small. So people start taking pictures of their own lives, things happening on a daily basis. Uh, and that's a real transition. Uh, when photography first came about, it was something only professionals could do, and the photographs were posed. Uh, so you don't get that kind of personal, immediate kind of photograph. It's all very staged. Um, and there weren't very many. They were expensive and it, some trouble to create, but by the late 19th century, we start seeing lots of them. And for us, the import of that is that they show us a lot of things about life at Ashland. So this is just a pile that I picked up. There are some people, probably some of the McDowell girls on the front steps. This is the dining room. Um, these are neat because they show us where artifacts are located and how they had the house set up. That's the drawing room. 
that is a descendant on a horse. I'm not sure if that's Henry Bullock. Does it say on the back? Nope. That's out front. Uh, that, she is probably one of the people that was employed here. And there's Anne sitting in one of the rooms of the house. That's a much later photograph. So you see we have lots of different things. I'll go through here and see if I can find some. That's a neat picture. That's not Henry Clay's carriage. That would have must have been a McDowell carriage. And that man is a man named Bob Holton. He drove the carriage and then later cars. And those are probably two of the McDowells behind him. So that's somewhere here on the grounds, I would think. That was in the conservatory out back. They liked the conservatory. Took a lot of pictures there. There's Major McDowell in the front hall. We also have this album. This was dated 1897, and I'm not sure what motivated it exactly, but it contains pictures of the house. One of the weird things about the house is that it was covered with ivy, and it's very difficult. <laughs> to, it seems to go back and forth. It would get very covered, then they'd clear it off, and it'd get covered again. So I have yet to figure out an exact timeline that I can use to determine the exact date of a picture based on uh, the amount of ivy on the house, but that's... The house with the ivy. And then this, this is the entrance hall. Uh, so you can see this is really useful. We use these photos to show people how the house was set up. We've actually used it in some cases to furnish the house. I'm not sure who this guy is. This painting is not here now. He may be one of the McDowells. Family China. The dining room. Actually, most of those pictures are in the dining room today. And here's the drawing room. We don't have that piano, but we now have an upright piano. Ah, that's in the library looking into the study. Notice the moose head. Uh, I assume that was probably something taken by Major McDowell, who was a big game hunter. Uh, notice the clutter. This is very Victorian. The late Victorian period, having clutter was desirable. It was a you know, sign of means, I guess, etc. So you see all the stuff. That is the gas fixture that once hung from the snake's mouth in the library. Ah, oh, there's our moose. You can get a good look at the moose. This is in what is now the billiard room. The billiard table obviously wasn't there at that particular moment. That bird is Fezzi the pheasant. Fezzi was here when I came. Unfortunately, he deteriorated rather badly, and eventually his back end fell off. And my feeling was when the butt falls off the bird, the bird goes in the can, so he's gone. Uh, but anyway, so it's a neat album. Uh, it tells us a lot of things about Ashland. You can see we have a lot of pictures that show us a lot of stuff. If you're interested in photography, we have a book that I did uh, 13 years ago now. Wow. Uh, called Ashland and Henry Clay Estate. It's part of the Images of America series by Arcadia Press, and it is chuck full of photographs. There are a little over 200 photos in there, I believe. So if you like what you're seeing here, this book has a lot more, and we sell that in the shop. Uh, it's also sold at a number of outlets around town. Um, so you can get it right off our website, um, and it's a neat way to look at the estate. Um, it tells that story in a different way than often is it is told. So... Anyway, that's our story for today. I hope you've enjoyed looking at some of these faces from the past and learning a little bit about photographic processes. These are certainly not all by any means. We have many more in the collection. Um, and at UK, they have the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation papers, which are the papers that were here until 1991-92 when we did the re renovation. Those papers were taken to UK because we're not really a research repository. Good morning, Megan, and you're most welcome, and good morning, Katrina. Uh, those papers contain a very large collection of family photographs, and you can go online to the Explore UK Special Collections Research Portal and pull up Henry Clay Memorial Foundation papers and click on that, and if you click on the photographs thing in the list of contents, it, you can then scroll through. Every photograph has been scanned, so you can look at all of them. 
fascinating thing to look at. There are a couple of other family collections over there, the James Clay Papers, the Josephine uh, Russell, Josephine Clay Papers. Uh, so there are a few other collections that contain a few photographs as well, and those can all be viewed through the research portal. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate your comments. Uh, it was a lot of fun to write. I enjoyed doing the book immensely. Um, so uh, it was, and it was a neat opportunity to really get familiar with a lot of these photographs. Okay, well, uh, thank you for tuning in, and we'll look to see you again next week. Let's see, David asks, how many of the artifacts are actually stored on site? Well, we have uh, some photographs stored upstairs in artifact storage. We have a small collection. I don't know exactly how many, uh, you know, a few hundred maybe. Whereas at, at, at UK, the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation papers have several thousand photographs, I think, including most of the daguerreotypes. Um, so anyway, uh, there are quite a lot. Of, yeah, I'd be happy to autograph the book. Uh, just come on by or we'll, we'll work it out, but I'm, I'm glad to do that. Anyway, uh, so we have some, not as many as are at the Kennedy Clay Memorial Foundation papers, but we do have uh, some important photographs here as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you, and we'll see you next week. And go Sole Volante.